What's up, I'm Vin, and today I wanna to go through the 2024 grade five New York State math test, and I'll leave a link to a copy of these questions in the description below. Now let's get started. Question one, Carlos walks 3.65 kilometers on Saturday and 1.46 kilometers on Sunday. How many total kilometers does Carlos walk on Saturday and Sunday? So for this question, we're looking for the total amount of kilometers that Carlos walks on Saturday and Sunday. So we're gonna take these two values here and add them together, okay? So we're looking for the total. So we're gonna do 3.65 kilometers plus 1.46 kilometers. And notice that all of our answer choices here are just numbers. So all we have to worry about here are the numbers, but the units are gonna be kilometers. So now we have five plus six is 11. So we write our one and we carry the one from the tens place. And now I have six plus four is 10 plus one is 11. So I write a one and I carry the one in the tens place again from 11. And now we have one plus three plus one is five. And now the decimal just carries down like this. So our solution is going to be choice D. Question two, which expression is equivalent to five times three fourths? So for this question, it helps to know the commutative property of multiplication, which says that we could switch the order in which we multiply and we'll get the same thing. So we could say five times three fourths is equal to three fourths times five. And now the next thing to know is that multiplication is repeated addition. So if I wanna find what three over four times five is, what I could do is I could just add three fourths to itself five times, and that's gonna give us choice C. Question three, a diagram of a right rectangular prism made of unicubes is shown below. And we wanna know what measurement for the right rectangular prism is equal to the total number of cubes. So for this one here, the answer is going to be volume because volume tells us the space inside of a 3D shape. Okay, so this is the space inside, and we would measure the space inside with actual cubes. Okay, these are 3D shapes, so when we're talking about 3D units, we're talking about volume. The reason why it's not area, the area talks about how many squares we would need to cover the outside. Okay, so this is to cover the outside, and the units we would use for this would be square units. Okay, so that would be how many squares do I need to cover the outside of the shape here. Okay, so this would be, let's say here, one square unit, and that's gonna be the measurement for area. And now B and C are no good because the unit you would use to measure the height would just be one unit, okay? And for height, you would measure it with a one-dimensional measurement, just a straight line like this, okay? So this would be equal to just one unit like this, okay? So the dimensions for height is just a, a straight line segment like this, okay? So this is just one dimension. If you were to measure your height at the doctor's office, they'd have you stand against the wall and they would use a giant ruler or measuring stick of some sort to measure your height. Okay, so it's just measured on a straight line. And the same thing with the perimeter. The perimeter is going outside of the shape. It's the distance going all the way around. And you would measure that with a straight line segment as well. Okay, so this is just a one dimensional measurement. So that's why B and C are out. D is definitely our answer. Question four, what is 34.275 rounded to the nearest hundredth? So for this question here, we have to look to the hundredths place, which we have a seven here. And now we look to the right and notice that it's a five or higher. We have a five here. So we're gonna round up to 34.28. If this question instead had something like this, 34 point, let's say 274, then to the right of the hundredths place would be a four, which is less than five. So we would round down to 34.27. Okay, but in this case here, we had a five, so we're rounding up to 34.28, and we're gonna get choice D. Question seven, a group of four gold miners found 10 ounces of gold, and the miners share the gold equally. How much gold in ounces did each miner receive? So for this question here, just be very careful. It's very tempting to just say, oh, I have to divide because they're sharing the gold, and just say something like four over 10, and just circle choice B. <laughs> be careful, choice B is a very dangerous bear trap. You wanna think very, very carefully here. So think about the group of four gold miners are the ones that are splitting the gold and they found 10 ounces of gold. So we're gonna do 10 divided by four, okay? So the amount of gold that was found is what's being divided amongst the four gold miners. So just be very careful with word problems and think which quantity is being divided and which one is the divisor. So now we just have to do 10 divided by four. And for this one, we could use long division like this. We could say 10 divided by four 
And now I just think of the times tables for four. So I'm listing out the multiples of four. So I have four, eight, 12, and this continues on like this. And the closest I could get to 10 without going over would be four times two. And we have four times two is eight, we subtract, and we have a remainder of two. But now we write our remainder two over the original divisor four. So our solution here is two and two fourths, but let's reduce our fraction over here. We're gonna divide the numerator and denominator by two. And this is now gonna reduce to two and one half. Okay, so this is our mixed number. So our solution here is choice D. Question nine, a diagram of a three-dimensional figure is shown below, and we wanna know what is the volume in cubic inches of the figure. So for this question here, we have to be able to imagine what's going on in this space over here. So I'm just gonna draw down a line like this, and I'm gonna draw it also going into the shape like this. So I'm just gonna complete what's actually going on here in this part that we can't actually see. So this is the back of the shape over here, and then I'm gonna drop down this line over here as well. So you don't have to do this, but I think it just helps you imagine what's actually going on here and helps us describe all of the dimensions in this 3D shape. So what we're gonna do is if we're looking for volume, the volume of a rectangular prism is length times width times height. So right now what we have is this entire space is 10 inches, but this space over here is three inches. So since we have two rectangular prisms, not only is this space over here three inches, we could say that this space over here is also three inches. So we'll just write in, we have three inches over here, we have three inches over here. But now think about it, if this entire distance is 10 and this distance over here is three inches, we could just do 10 minus three and say that the remaining distance over here is seven inches, okay? So this space over here is seven inches, which tells us for this rectangular prism that we have this space going across is seven inches. And now the depth going backwards here, or we could say the width, is two inches. So that means if this is two inches, then this distance over here is two inches. And if I were to draw in more lines like this, we would see that this distance going back is also two inches. So you just have to know that in a rectangular prism that the lines opposite of each other are the same measure. Okay, so that's how I know when I see these lines over here that these two are gonna be the same measure because they're opposite of each other and they're facing the same direction. They are parallel. So now let's go ahead and use this formula. We're gonna find the volume of the first rectangular prism here. So the volume of the first one, I'll just say the volume of the first one, I'll put a little one here to indicate this is the first one. We're doing the length, we'll say is seven inches, times the width going back here is two inches, and then times the height of the shorter rectangular prism is eight inches. And now we just work this out here. So we have seven times two is 14, so I'll just do 14 times eight. And this math we could just do off to the side like this. So we'll just make that neater. We have 14 times eight, and now we're doing eight times four is 32. We carry the three, and we have eight times one is eight, plus three is 11. So this works out to 112. And now the volume of the second rectangular prism over here, the length is three inches, times the width is two inches, and then times the height is 12 inches. Okay, this one is taller, it goes up 12 inches. And now we're gonna do three times two is six, and then six times 12, we're gonna work out now. Six times 12 is 72. Now the last thing to do here is just to add these two together. We're doing 112 plus 72, because the total volume would be the sum of these two rectangular prisms. We have two plus two is four, one plus seven is eight, and the one carries down. So the total volume is 184 cubic inches. Question 10, Stephen has three cups of raisins. He shares all the raisins equally among himself and his friends. If each person gets one fourth cup of raisins, how many people in total get raisins? So for this question, it helps to know this about divisibility. If I say something like 72 divided by nine is equal to eight, I could also say that 72 divided by eight is equal to nine. So this idea is gonna help us answer this question. So Stephen has three cups of raisins and he's sharing them equally among himself and his friends. So what we have here is we have three divided by the mystery number of people is equal to one fourth. But what we could also do with this is we could say that three divided by one fourth is equal to the mystery number of people. The same way we could say 72 divided by nine is eight, 
we could say 72 divided by 8 is 9. So we could switch these two here, and that'll tell us what we need. So once again, we want to know 3 divided by blank is 1 fourth. So we could do 3 divided by 1 fourth, and that'll give us the mystery number of people that we need. So now let's do 3 divided by 1 fourth. And the trick we're going to use here to divide by this fraction is keep change flip. So what we do is when we divide by a fraction, we keep the first term. So we're going to keep the 3. We're going to change the operation to multiplication. And we're going to flip the fraction, which means we're going to switch the numerator and denominator. So we're going to switch this to 4 over 1. But 4 divided by 1 is just 4. So we're doing 3 times 4, which is equal to 12. Okay, So the answer here is choice D. Now, one thing you could do before you move on is you could check your answer. So let's just see. If we do 3 divided by 12, this is going to give us, we could write this in fraction form, 3 over 12. And if we reduce this fraction, dividing the top and bottom by 3, notice that we get 3 divided by 3 is 1, and 12 divided by 3 is 4. And that gives us the 1 fourth that they told us in the question. So choice D is definitely correct. Question 12, Saul has $6 in quarters, and he uses all of the quarters to play video games. If each game requires three quarters, what is the total number of video games that Saul plays? So the first thing we need to know here is that $1 is equal to four quarters. So the first thing I would find is how many quarters does Saul have? So what we have here, we're going to do six times four, because if Saul has $6 and there's four quarters for each dollar, we could just do six times four to tell us here that Saul has 24 quarters. Okay, so this is the number of quarters that Saul has. But now the next thing we want to think of is how much does each game cost? So they told us here that each game requires three quarters. And we want to know what is the total number. We'll just make that a little neater. We want to know what is the total number of video games that Saul plays. Well, we need groups of three here, groups of three quarters to play video games. So if we just take the total number of quarters, 24, and we divide it by three, that'll tell us how many video games that Saul could play at this arcade place or wherever Saul is playing these games. So we're doing 24 divided by three is equal to eight. So this tells us that Saul could play eight video games at this location. Question 15, a company has an annual employee picnic. The company rents buses to transport the employees to the picnic area. There are 1,320 employees, and each bus carries a total of 54 employees. What is the minimum number of buses the company needs to transport all of the employees to the picnic area? So for this question here, we just have to think very carefully about what each of these numbers mean. So there are 1,320 employees, and they're all going by bus to some picnic, and each bus carries 54 employees. So we're going to do 1,320 divided by 54. So now let's work this out. We could say that 54 goes into 132. We could get as close as 54 times 2. The math that I'm doing in my head, the reason why I know this is 2 without a calculator, is I just round to the nearest 10, and I think of 50. If I count by 50s, I have 50, 100, 150, and this continues on and on. This is a lot like the 5 times tables with just an extra 0. So what I think of here is that 132 is less than 150. So we could get as close as times 2. And if we work this out, 54 times 2 is 108. And this we could just show on the side here. 2 times 4 is 8. And then 2 times 5 is 10. So we get as close as 108. And now we could do the subtraction here. So we can't do 2 minus 8 because that will put us into the negative. So we're going to borrow here from the tens place and make this a 2. And now we could turn this into a 12 and do 12 minus 8 is 4. And then we have 2 minus 0 is 2. And now we bring down the 0. And now we're going to use the same exact reasoning here, that if I count by 50s, I could get as close as times 4 because times 5 would put me at 250, which would tip me over. So I'm going to put a 4 here. And now I have to do 54 times 4. So we're going to do times 4. And we have 4 times 4 is 16. We carry the 1. And then 4 times 5 is 20, plus 1 is 21. So we're subtracting 216. So now we do the subtraction, and we have to borrow again. We make this a 3. We put a 1 here, and 10 minus 6 is 4. 3 minus 1 is 2. So we have a remainder of 24. But now think about this very, very, very carefully. Okay, The remainder, you might think here that 24 over 54 
we could say, oh, this is closer to 24 than it is to 25. If we round, we could see here that this decimal value here or this fraction, if we're looking between 24 and 25, you might say that this is closer to 24 than it is to 25. So let's round down to 24, but we have to be very, very, very careful here, okay? We can't round to the nearest whole number here. This is a word problem. We have to think about this carefully. It's not like we could say, oh, just give me the 24, or just give me 24 buses, the 24 leftover people, they'll just be left to walk or something. Everyone has to take the bus, so they're going to have to order the 25th bus, and there'll just be some extra space on some of the buses. Okay, so we're going to have to order one more bus, and that'll tip us over to 25. Question 16, which comparison is true? So for this one here, we have to know inequalities. When the inequality is facing this way, it says greater than. When the inequality is facing this way, it says less than. The way I remember this is I just think that the less than sign kind of looks like an L that's been turned a little bit. So that's how I remember those. But a fun way to answer these questions is I just think of Pac-Man. And I just say that Pac-Man would prefer to eat the bigger number. So I just imagine that the inequality sign is his mouth. And I could see here that choice C is going to be our answer because 0 0.27 is definitely less than 0 0.36. If I drew in a Pac-Man here, he would prefer to eat the bigger number. So if this doesn't make sense, what you could do is write this as a fraction. You could say that 27 over 100 is less than 36 over 100. When you're comparing fractions, fractions that have the same denominator, the greater fraction has the greater numerator. Okay, so this you could use once you know the fractions have the same denominator, which for all of these decimal values here, this is going to be the case. So when we look at the wrong answers, why are these all wrong? Well, 4 hundredths is not greater than 14 hundredths. You can see here that the denominators are the same, but if we look at these numerators here, I'll just clean this one up a little bit, that 14 is greater than 4, so we can't say 4 over 100 is greater than 14 over 100. So that's why this one is out. And then the reasoning for choice B, 83 hundredths is not greater than 92 hundredths, okay? The inequality would have to flip for this one to be true. And then for the last one here, 52 hundredths is not less than 49 hundredths. So this one here would be greater than if we wanted to make it true. Choice D is out. Choice C is definitely our answer. Question 19, which statement about the relationship between parallelograms and rectangles is true? So choice A, we have all parallelograms are rectangles, but not all rectangles are parallelograms. This one is not true, and all I have to do here is provide a counterexample. If I drew my parallelogram like this on a slant, then I would not have four right angles. You could see that this angle over here, the way I drew it, is acute, and this angle over here, the way I drew it, is obtuse. The acute angles are the ones that are less than 90 degrees. And when I think of 90 degrees, I just think of an L shape like this. So you can see that this angle here is smaller. It's just cutting in kind of like this, so it's a smaller angle. An obtuse angle is more than 90. So the way I drew this parallelogram, this is clearly not a rectangle because it does not have four right angles. So next we have all rectangles are parallelograms. So far, this is true. Okay, if we draw a rectangle, what qualifies a rectangle as a parallelogram is that the opposite sides are parallel. Okay, so this pair of opposite sides here, these two line segments are parallel as well as these two line segments. So we have a parallelogram here. So, so far so good. And then we have, but not all parallelograms are rectangles. That is also true based on what I just drew over here. We don't have four right angles in this parallelogram. So this is not a rectangle. So choice B is good. But now let's see why are the remaining answer choices no good. Choice C, all rectangles are parallelograms is definitely true. And all parallelograms are rectangles. This one is false. And this parallelogram that I drew over here is the counterexample that rules out choice C. And then choice D, not all parallelograms are rectangles. That is true. There are some parallelograms like this one that are not rectangles. And not all rectangles are parallelograms. This part here is false. All rectangles are parallelograms because both pairs of opposite sides are parallel. So D is out. Definitely choice B. Question 27, what is the value of the expression 1 over 7 divided by 5? So for this one here, what I would do is I would rewrite this as 1 over 7 divided by 5 over 1. 
Just know any whole number you could write as the whole number divided by one, because when you divide by one, it does not change the value of a number. And now the technique that we're gonna use here is keep, change, flip. So we're gonna keep the first fraction the same, and now we're gonna change the operation to multiplication, and we're going to flip the second fraction, in this case, to one over five. And now remember, when you multiply fractions, you do not need common denominators, okay? You could have different denominators here and multiply fractions. Students mix that up, but that's only for adding and subtracting fractions that you need common denominators. For this, we just do one times one in the numerator, and then we do seven times five in the denominator, okay? So we're just gonna multiply the numerators and multiply the denominators. So we have one times one is one, over seven times five is 35, and our answer here is gonna be choice A. Question 28, Marcel has two and a third cups of milk. He uses two thirds of a cup for his cereal and one and one fourth cups for a pancake recipe. And we wanna know how much milk in cups does Marcel have remaining? So for this question here, we have to know that when Marcel uses the milk, the milk is being subtracted, okay? So we're going to subtract these numbers. So we're starting off, Marcel has a total of two and a third cups of milk. And first he uses two thirds of a cup. So we're gonna subtract this one first. So what we could do here is we could either borrow from the two to make this an improper fraction, or we could turn the entire mixed number into an improper fraction. We can't just subtract right now because one third is less than two thirds. So we're gonna to have to do something here. So let's say we wanna turn this into an improper fraction. We're gonna multiply two times three. So we're gonna do two times three, and then we're gonna add the one up top, okay? So then we're gonna add here. So that's the technique for turning a mixed number into an improper fraction. And this is over three, and remember, we're still subtracting two thirds. So now we're gonna multiply before we add. We do two times three is six, plus one is seven. So we have seven over three, and then we have minus two over three. And now that we have common denominators, we could just subtract here. We're gonna do seven minus two is five over the denominator three. So now we have Marcel has five thirds of a cup of milk remaining, but remember, he uses one and one fourth cups for a pancake recipe. Now, one thing we could do right away is I'll just convert this one over here, this mixed number into an improper fraction. And we're gonna do four times one, and then plus this numerator here of one over the denominator is four. So we have four times one is four, plus one is five. So we have five over four. So now we're gonna take the remaining milk, five thirds, and we're gonna subtract five over four. So to subtract these two fractions, we're gonna to have to make common denominators. So what I see here is we're gonna multiply the first fraction by four over four, and we'll multiply the second fraction here by three over three. So now we have four times five is 20 over 12, minus we have five times three is 15 over four times three is 12. And now we just subtract the numerators here. We have 20 minus 15 is five over, we keep the denominator 12, and this is gonna match up with choice A. Question 30, what is the area in square units of a rectangle with side lengths three and three fourths units and nine and a half units? So for this one here, we have to know that the area of a rectangle is equal to length times width, okay? So this is the formula that we need. And if you wanna see what this would look like, we could just draw out a rectangle and see that the long side is gonna be nine and a half units and the shorter side is three and three quarter units. So for this one here, we're just gonna multiply these two mixed numbers together, okay? So the area is equal to nine and a half and then times three and three fourths units. So what we could do is convert each of these mixed numbers into improper fractions and then we can multiply. All right, it's very tempting when you look at this to just say, oh, okay, let's just do nine times three is 27, and then do one half times three over four, one times three is three, two times four is eight, and you get choice B. <coughs> choice B is a very dangerous bear trap, okay? There's a little bit more to this that we have to be careful of, okay? We're not gonna be doing this. We just have to think a little bit more. So we're gonna actually have to use the technique of converting these mixed numbers into improper fractions. So first we're gonna do nine times two is 18, and then plus the one up top, and this is over two. And we're multiplying this by, we're doing four times three is 12, and then plus three 
is 15 over 4. Okay, so now we'll just simplify this. We have 18 plus 1 is 19 over 2. And then times, we have 12 plus 3 is 15. And this is over 4. So now from here, what we're going to do is do 19 times 15. So I'll do that math off to the side. We're doing 19 times 15. So here comes long multiplication. 5 times 9 is 45. We carry the 4. And then we have 5 times 1 is 5 plus 4 is 9. We put a placeholder here, a 0. And now we have 1 times 9 is 9. And we have 1 times 1 is 1. And now we just add these numbers up. We have 5 plus 0 is 5. 9 plus 9 is 18. We carry the 1. And 1 plus 1 is 2. So when we multiply the numerators here, 19 times 15 is 285. So now we multiply the denominators. We have 2 times 4 is 8. And now to simplify this, we just have to do long division. So we're just going to divide 285 by 8. And if we work this out here, we have 8 goes into 28 three times. And if we multiply, 3 times 8 is 24. We subtract, and we have a remainder of 4. And now we carry down the 5. And 8 goes into 45 five times. And if we multiply, 5 times 8 is 40. So when we subtract, we have a remainder of 5. Now the remainder goes up here in the numerator. And our denominator is going to be the original divisor. So we have 35 and 5 eighths. The correct answer here is choice C. Question 31, Rita is walking on a trail that is 2.5 kilometers long. She has walked 0.72 kilometers of the trail so far. And we want to know how many more kilometers does Rita still need to walk to complete the trail. So here we're told that the entire length of the trail is 2.5 kilometers. So I'm just going to draw this line segment over here and label it 2.5 kilometers. And then next we're told that Rita walked 0.72 kilometers so far. Okay, so over here we'll just say that this is 0.72 kilometers. So if we want to know how much more she has to go, we're going to subtract out the part that she already walked, and that'll tell us the length remaining. So we're going to do 2.5 minus 0.72. We're subtracting these numbers here. Now, in this case here, I'm going to put a 0 as a placeholder. That way, we could do the subtraction nicely. So we can't do 0 minus 2 because 0 is less than 2. So we're going to have to borrow here and turn this 5 into a 4. Okay, so we're borrowing from the tenths place. And now that we've borrowed from the tenths place, we could go over to the right and put a 1 here. And we're doing 10 minus 2 is 8. And now, same reasoning, we can't do 4 minus 7 because 4 is less than 7. So we're going to borrow here from the 1's place and make this 2 into a 1. And now we could put the 1 over here and do 14 minus 7 is 7. And then we do 1 minus 0 is 1. And the decimal just carries down. So Rita has 1.78 kilometers to go. Question 32, what is the value of the expression shown below? And we have 1 half plus 2 thirds minus a fourth. So for this question here, the concept that we need is least common multiples. We're going to find the least common multiple of all three denominators, and that's going to allow us to find a common denominator, which will allow us to combine all three fractions. So the denominators here are 2, 3, and 4. And if we count by 2s, 3s, and 4s, the first place that all of these numbers are going to match up is going to be at 12. So we count by 2s first, then we count by 3s, and then we count by 4s. And if I list all the multiples here for 2, 3, and 4, you'll see that the first place that all three match is at 12. So 12 is the number we care about. So first up, we have 1 half, and then we have plus 2 over 3, and then minus 1 over 4. And we want to make all of these denominators match. Well, to get from 2 to 12 by multiplication, we would have to do times 6. But with fractions, if you multiply the denominator by 6, you have to multiply the numerator by 6. Otherwise, you're going to get a fraction that's not equal to, in this case, 1 half. So then next, if we want to turn the 3 into a 12, we're going to go times 4. So we're going to do times 4 on top and bottom. And then last, to turn this denominator 4 into 12, we're going to go times 3 over 3. So now we work this out. 1 times 6 is 6. And then we're, now we're over 12 because we're doing 2 times 6. And then plus 2 times 4 is 8. 3 times 4 is 12. And then we have minus 1 times 3 is 3. And 4 times 3 is 12. So now we just go piece by piece here. We could just go from left to right. We're going to do first 6 over 12 plus 8 over 12. And if we do 6 plus 8, that's 14. And we're over 12. And we still have to subtract 3 over 12. 
So now for this part here, we're just doing 14 minus 3 is 11. And we're over 12, so the solution here is 11 twelfths. Choice C is our answer. Question 33, Lisa drew a four-sided shape that had exactly one pair of parallel lines and two right angles. Which list correctly classifies the shape Lisa drew? Well, for this one here, the key phrase is that the shape had exactly one pair of parallel lines and two right angles. So we could just start eliminating choices. A square has four right angles. So right away, choice A is no good. It has too many right angles. A rectangle also has four right angles, not two. So we could eliminate choice C. And now we look at choice D. Why is this one not possible? Why can't we have a rhombus parallelogram quadrilateral? Well, we have just one pair of parallel lines. So if we had a rhombus, which I like to think of as a slanted square, all four sides are equal. And we have a parallelogram here. I'll just make this a little bit neater. So we have a slanted square. And in this case here, all four sides are equal. And we have two pairs of parallel lines. Okay, not one pair, we have two pairs. So that's why choice D is no good. So just by process of elimination, it has to be choice B. But just know a trapezoid has just one pair of parallel lines. And if we have two right angles, we could draw the trapezoid to look something like this. I kind of think of this as almost like you're drawing a shoe. Okay, if you're not a great artist like me, your shoes might look like this if you had to draw them. And there is the pair of parallel lines, and there are the two right angles. The way that we drew this, this angle over here is acute. It's not 90 degrees, it's not a right angle. And this angle over here, just make that a little neater, is the obtuse angle that's more than 90 degrees. Okay, so that's why choice B is correct. We have a trapezoid, it's a quadrilateral, which means that it has four sides. And a polygon just means that it has many sides. Okay, so four sides in this case. So choice B is our answer. Question 34, Elsie has two equal sized bags of rice. One bag is one third full and the other bag is one fifth full. She combines the rice into one of the bags. What fraction of a full bag of rice does Elsie now have after combining the rice? So the key word here is combines. Since Elsie is combining the two bags, she is adding the rice together. So one bag is one third full and the other bag is one fifth full. So we're gonna add here one third plus one fifth. And just be careful, please don't do one plus one is two, three plus five is eight and say, oh, two over eight, if we reduce this, is equal to one fourth. And notice here, we have choice B. <coughs> but here, choice B is a very dangerous bear trap. Okay, you have to know to add fractions, you have to find common denominators. So in this case here, what we're gonna do first is find common denominators. So we're gonna multiply the first fraction by five over five, and we'll multiply the second fraction by three over three. Remember, you are allowed to multiply a single fraction on top and bottom by the same number. It's gonna give you an equivalent fraction. So we have five times one is five, over five times three is 15. And now we have plus one times three is three, over five times three is 15. And now we just add the numerators together. We have five plus three is eight. We keep the denominator the same, and now we have eight over 15. Choice D is our answer. Question 35, the distance between two houses on a street is 450 meters. What is the distance measured in kilometers? So for this one here, we have to know that 1,000 meters is equal to one kilometer. Okay, so this we have to know. And now a lot of students get stuck here. They say, oh no, do I take 450 and do I divide it or multiply it by 1,000? Well, one observation to make here is that the number in front of the meters is bigger, okay? So that's one thing, the bigger number, so the bigger number is in front of meters. So if we're trying to find the answer in kilometers and we're starting with 450 meters, in this case here, we're going to divide by 1,000 and then we could say the distance in kilometers, okay? so. That's just a little trick that I use is I look for where is the bigger number. And if I'm looking for the smaller number here, in, in this case here in front of kilometers, then I'm going to, in this case, divide by a thousand instead of multiply. And you could even see here, if you did 450 times a thousand, all that would do is you're doing 450 times one, 
is 450, and then you add three zeros. This is a shortcut for multiplying by numbers like this that have trailing zeros. And notice that this number doesn't even show up. So if we were to step in that bear trap, there is not even an answer waiting for us. Okay, so from here, what we're going to do is just convert this to a decimal. This is 450 thousandths. Okay, so what we're going to do is write 0 0.450 like this. And now we could say kilometers, but this zero to the right of the five is insignificant. Okay, this zero is just a placeholder. So we can just say that this is equal to 0 0.45 kilometers. Okay, another thing we could do here is reduce this fraction. Not completely, but we could just cross off the common zeros and we have 45 hundredths. But either way here, we're going to get 0 0.45. Choice C is our answer. Question 36, Calvin has a box in the shape of a right rectangular prism. He packs it with unit cubes to determine its volume. The dimensions of the box are listed below. And then we have each unit cube is one cubic inch. And we want to know how many unit cubes will Calvin need to completely fill the box. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to find the volume of this rectangular prism. So we're going to use the formula volume equals, and we have length times width times height. So this is the formula we're going to use here. And we're told that each unit cube is one cubic inch. So when we find the volume of this rectangular prism, that's going to tell us how many unit cubes that Calvin needs to fill the box. So now all we do is just multiply the length, width, and height. And we're just going to write the numbers here. We're going to have 16 for the length times 7 for the width. And then we have the height is equal to 8. So now if I could do this any way I want, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to choose to multiply 7 and 8 because it's harder to do 16 times 7 in your head. But 7 times 8 is equal to 56. So we could say 16 times 56. And now all we have to do here is the long multiplication. We have 56 times 16. And now I have 6 times 6 is 36. I carry the 3. And then I have 5 times 6 is, is 30. And then 30 plus 3 is 33. And now I could put a 0 here as a placeholder. And we do 1 times 6 is 6. And then 1 times 5 is 5. And now we just add everything up. We're going to have 6 plus 0 is 6, 3 plus 6 is 9, and then 3 plus 5 is equal to 8. So the volume here is equal to 896, and the units would be cubic inches for the volume. But all we have to say at the end is how many unit cubes would it take? It would take 896 unit cubes. Question 37, a family takes a cake to a party. When the family is ready to leave the party, three-fourths of the cake is left. The family leaves half of the leftover cake at the party and takes the remaining cake home. What fraction of all of the cake does the family take home? So for this one here, if we just want to go through the math, there's three-fourths of the cake left, and the family is going to take half of this. So if we multiply by one-half, this is going to tell us how much of the cake that the family takes home. So we just do three times one is three over four times two is eight. So the family is going to take three-eighths of the cake. But if we really want to understand the concept behind what's happening here, what we could do is look at there is three-fourths of the cake left. So that means that so far at the party, this much of the cake has been eaten. Okay, so people ate. I'll just say that someone ate this piece and someone ate this piece here. So this is how much is left. And remember, the family took half of what was left. So notice that there's one, two, three, four, five, six pieces left. So the family is just going to take half of that. So that's why they're taking three-eighths of the cake home. And that's going to give us our solution here to question 37. Okay, but all we have to write here, what fraction of the cake? We're going to say three-eighths of the cake. Question 38, a teacher has 55 sheets of stickers with a total of 1,320 stickers. Each sheet has the same number of stickers, and we want to know how many stickers are on each sheet. So for this question here, each sheet has the same number of stickers. So that tells us we could just divide the total number of stickers, which is 1,320, by the number of sheets. Okay, so we're going to divide by 55. And that's going to tell us how many stickers are on each sheet. Now, for this question, what I'm thinking of is counting by 50s. Okay, so that's what comes to mind here. I just think 50, and then after 50, if we add 50, we get 100, and then 150, and then after this would be 200 and so on. But notice what we have here, we have 132. So we can't go up to 150 because that would be too, too much. It would be past 132. So we have to stop at times two, okay? So that's how I know just doing the math in my head 
that 55 times 2 is as close we could get to 132 without going over. So now 55 times 2 is 110, and we subtract. Okay, so we have 2 minus 0 is 2, 3 minus 1 is 2, and then 1 minus 1 is 0, so we don't have to do anything here. And now we just bring down the 0. And now this one here, I'm thinking of times 4. So let's see what happens if we put a 4 here. So now we do 55 times 4, and I'll do this off to the side. We have 4 times 5 is 20. We carry the 2. And then 4 times 5 is still 20. 20 plus 2 is 22. And notice that we get 220 exactly. So we're going to have no remainder here. This is going to divide evenly, and this tells us that there are 24 stickers on each sheet. So we'll just record our answer over here. There are 24 stickers on each sheet. Question 39, students in a fifth grade math class measure the lengths of 12 erasers. The line plot below shows the results, and we want to know what is the total length in inches of all the erasers when they are lined up end to end. So for this one here, what we could do is we could just count to see how many erasers we have that are one-fourth inches long, half an inch long, and three-quarters of an inch long, and then we could multiply and add everything up. So what I mean by that is look at the erasers that are one-fourth of an inch. There are one, two, three, four, five, six erasers that are one-fourth of an inch. So I could do one-fourth plus a fourth plus a fourth and so on and do this six times, or what I could do is I could just do one-fourth times six. Okay, so I'm just going to do one-fourth times six, or I could even just say six times one-fourth like this. And when you multiply a whole number by a fraction, you can just do six times one is six over the denominator four. If that didn't make sense, all you have to do is call this six over one, and now you have six times one is six over one times four is four. And now what we could do here is just write this as a mixed number, or we could leave it as an improper fraction. Either way is fine. Let's leave this as an improper fraction, but I'll reduce this so that the adding later is easier. So I'll divide the top and bottom here by two, and this reduces to three over two. If you just know that this is one and a half and you want to write one and a half, you can. Otherwise, you could just leave it like this for now. So now the erasers that are half an inch, there are three erasers that are half an inch. So if I do three times one half, that tells us how much distance these three erasers will cover if we line them up. So here, I'm just going to say 3 times 1 is 3 over 2. And once again, if that didn't make sense, you could just call this 3 over 1. And you're doing 3 times 1 is 3 over 1 times 2 is 2. And now for the erasers that are 3 quarters of an inch, there are 3 of them. So I just do 3 times 3 fourths. And for this one, I'm going to do 3 times 3 is 9 over 4. And once again, if you want to write this over 1, you can. But if you just understand now, you see the pattern that we're just multiplying this whole number by the numerator, then you could just show your work like this and that's fine. But now we want to know what is the total length in inches of the erasers when they are lined up end to end. So now I'm just going to add everything up. So I'm going to do 3 over 2 plus 3 over 2 plus 9 over 4. And for this one, we could do this piece by piece, but I could add these two together first and do 3 plus 3 is 6 over, and I keep the denominator as 2. And then I have plus 9 over 4. And now from here, what we could do is we could do 6 divided by 2 is 3. Plus, and if we have to, we could do this off to the side. 9 divided by 4 or 9 over 4. 4 goes into 9. We could get as close as 4 times 2. 4 times 2 is 8, and we have a remainder of 1. So the remainder goes in the numerator, and 4, the original divisor, goes in the denominator. So we're doing 3 plus 2 and 1 fourth. And this is something that we could do nicely here because notice that there is no fraction to the right of the 3. So this is just a whole number, and we're adding a mixed number. So 3 plus 2 is 5, and the 1 fourth just tags along. So the total distance, or the total length, is 5 and 1 fourth inches. Question 40, a tabletop is completely covered with square tiles as shown below. Each square tile has a side length of half a foot. What is the area in square feet of the tabletop? So we're looking for the area here. So the formula that we're going to need is area equals length times width. But one thing to be careful of is that we're not counting by ones. We're counting by half a foot. So notice going across, we have one, two, three, four, five tiles, and they're half a foot long each. So what we could do is we could say that the length is equal to 5 times 1 half of a foot. And if we work this out, 5 times a half, I could call this 5 over 1. We're going to do 5 times 1 is 5. 
over one times two is two. So it's five over two feet. Or I could just say two and a half feet if I want to turn this into a mixed number here. You can just see here, if we count by a half, we have a half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half. But if you want to just multiply, you could just multiply. And now for the width, notice that this way, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have seven times one half. And this time we're going to get seven times half a foot is equal to seven over two feet. And now from here, we're just going to do the length times the width. So the area is equal to, we have five over two times seven over two. And they're telling us that the units here is going to be square feet. Okay. So when we get to the end here, this is going to be in square feet. So now we have five times seven is 35 over two times two is four. And we're allowed to leave our answer like this in fraction form, but if you want to turn this into a mixed number, what you could do is you could do 35 divided by 4, and you could just say 4 goes into 35 8 times. 8 times 4 is 32, and that's going to give us a remainder of 3. So I put my remainder of 3 up in the numerator, and my 4 goes in the denominator. So I could say 8 and 3 fourths square feet, or 35 over 4. The advantage to stopping here is that if you mess up at this step, they are going to take a point off. So if you just want to stop here, you'll get the full credit. But if you want your answer to look nice, then go ahead and turn this into a mixed number. And you're going to have 8 and 3 fourths square feet. Question 41. Rosa and Steve each have a baseball card collection. Steve has one-eighth as many baseball cards in his collection as Rosa. Who has more baseball cards? And we have to be sure to include what we know about fractions in our answer. So what I'm thinking about here is a diagram for the fraction that we're dealing with. We have a fraction of 1 8th. So I just imagine here that we have some circle and I'm gonna cut this into eight equal pieces. So when we're talking about Steve, Steve has 1 8th as many baseball cards as Rosa. So just imagine this is all of Rosa's baseball cards. Steve only has this many. So Rosa has this much and Steve's amount is just a fraction of what Rosa has, but the fraction 1 8th is between 0 and 1. So Steve is going to have less because he only has a part of what Rosa has in her entire collection. But now, how do we explain this? Well, what we could say here is that since Steve has 1 8th as many baseball cards as Rosa, we could take Rosa's cards, the amount that she has, and divide it by 8, which would result in a smaller number. Question 42, a student incorrectly wrote the number 362 and 408 thousandths in expanded form as shown below. So the first thing I want to do here is just write this number out. We have 362 and 408 thousandths. Okay, so this is the number here in actual, you know, expressing it out in numerical form here. So now this is the expanded form of this number, and we want to know what error did the student make when writing the number in expanded form, we have to be sure to include the correct number in standard form in our answer. So here's the correct number in standard form here. And now let's look. We have a 3 in the hundreds place. So 3 times 100 is good. And then we have a 6 in the tens place. So 6 times 10 is also good for the expanded form. We have a 2 in the ones place. So this is fine. We have a 4 in the tenths place. So 4 times 1 over 10 is also good. So the mistake just by process of elimination has to be here, but let's see why. The eight is in the thousandths place. Okay, this is in the thousandths place. So that is where the student went wrong. Okay, they wrote eight times one over 100. So this would be correct if this was 362.48. Okay, but to fix this, the student would just have to put a zero over here. So that's just the mistake jumping out. We just go piece by piece. So what error did the student make? They wrote the eight times one over a hundred instead of eight times one over a thousand. Question 43, the base of the right rectangular prism shown below is filled with unicubes. How many more unicubes are needed to completely fill the right rectangular prism? So for a question like this, what we want to do is we're going to find the total volume of this right rectangular prism and then we're going to count the number of cubes that are already there and subtract it from the total. Okay, so first let's find the total volume. So we're just going to multiply the length, width, and height. So we'll say the length here is 6. So we have 6 
times the width is 2, and then times the height is 8. And we just work this out. We have volume equals. We'll multiply 6 times 2 first to get 12. And then 12 times 8 is equal to 96. But remember, we want to know how many more cubes are needed to completely fill the right rectangular prism. So we're going to subtract out the number of cubes we already have. Now, if you want to use this formula again and just treat this as a separate right rectangular prism, you can. Or you could just count the number of cubes. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay? If I wanted to do this with the formula, I would just do 6 times 2 times the height here is 1 if I'm just talking about this separate piece over here. So now what we have is we're just going to subtract. We're going to do 96 minus 12. Okay, so we're going to do 96 minus 12. So that tells us after we do the subtraction here that 84 more cubes are needed. Question 44, our last question. We have Liam makes and sells handmade blankets. He buys 18 yards of fabric at a rate of $6.75 per yard. Liam uses 1.5 yards of fabric to make each blanket and uses all of the fabric. Liam sells each blanket for $18.75. What is the profit Liam makes after buying the fabric and selling all the blankets? So for a question like this, there's a lot of steps. But let's break this down piece by piece. What are we actually looking for here? We're looking for what is the profit Liam makes. So here we just have to think about how do we find profit? Well, profit, we could say in this question here, is equal to the amount of money that Liam makes. Okay, so the money made, so the money made minus the cost of everything. Okay, so Liam does have to spend money to buy materials, but whatever money he makes minus the cost is going to be his profit. So now let's go ahead and find each piece here. The amount of money that Liam makes and the cost we could find. So let's think about what we have. He buys, so this is what Liam's cost is because he's buying this, 18 yards of fabric at a rate of $6.75 per yard. So if we multiply these two here, this will tell us the cost. The cost is equal to, we have 18 yards, so I'll just abbreviate like this. We have 18 yards times the rate is $6.75 per yard. Okay, so here is the rate here. So $6.75 per yard. And what this tells us is how much money Liam is going to spend. So now we just work this out. I'm going to do $6.75 and I'm going to multiply by 18. So from here, I'm going to do 8 times 5 is 40. I carry the 4 and then I'll just make that a little bit neater. We have 8 times 7 is 56. 56 plus 4 is 60. So I put a 0 and I put my 6 here. And then we have 8 times 6 is 48. 48 plus 6 is 54. And then from this step here, what we could do is put our placeholder. And now we go to the next column here, or the next row. We have 1 times 5 is 5. We have 1 times 7 is 7. 1 times 6 is 6. Now we just add everything together. We have 0 plus 0, 0 plus 5 is 5, 4 plus 7 is 11, we carry the 1, and then 1 plus 5 is 6, and 6 plus 6 is 12. But now let's just think here, we ignored two decimal places. I basically did 675 times 18, so I just have to pay two decimal places back. So I'm going to move the decimal two spaces like this, and that's going to give us 121.50. Okay, so Liam's cost of doing business here is going to be $121.50. And 50 cents. So now the next thing we need to find here is how much money Liam makes. So now for the next part of this question, we're going to find out how much money Liam makes. So remember, he buys 18 yards of fabric and he uses 1.5 yards of fabric to make each blanket. So the first thing we could find here is how many blankets can Liam make. So if we do 18 divided by 1.5, that'll tell us how many blankets Liam will make. And for this, we could write this as a fraction, 18 over 1.5. And now what I want to do is I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by 10. And this is going to give us 180. Because when you multiply a whole number by 10, we just add a 0 at the end. Over, and if I do 1.5 times 10, that's just going to move the decimal one place to the right and turn this into 15. So I would rather do 180 divided by 15. 
And let's just go ahead and do that. 15 goes into 18 once. 1 times 15 is 15. And when we subtract, we have a remainder of 3. We bring down the 0, and 15 goes into 30 twice. 2 times 15 is 30, so it divides evenly. So we could say here that Liam could make 12 blankets. Okay, so Liam makes 12 blankets in total, and he sells each blanket for $18.75. So we could say here that the amount of money made, okay, so we could say Liam makes, so Liam makes, and we'll write it out over here, we're going to say 12 blankets, and he's charging $18.75. So now what we could do is just work out the multiplication here. So we're just going to do the long multiplication. So I'm going to do 18.75 times 12. Okay, and I'm going to pretend I'm doing 1,875 times 12, and I'll just pay the two decimals back at the end. So 2 times 5 is 10. I carry the 1. 2 times 7 is 14, plus 1 is 15. I carry the 1. 2 times 8 is 16, plus 1 is 17. I carry the 1. And then 2 times 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3. I put a placeholder, and now I'm doing 1 times 5 is 5. 1 times 7 is 7. 1 times 8 is 8. And 1 times 1 is 1. And now we just add all this stuff together. So we have 0, 5 plus 5 is 10, carry the 1. 7 plus 7 is 14, plus 1 is 15, and we carry the 1. And then we have 1 plus 3 is 4, plus 8 is 12, carry the 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. And now I just pay the two decimals back. So I move this decimal two places to the right. And this tells us that Liam makes $225. But now, to find the profit, remember what I said before. Profit is the amount of money that Liam makes minus the cost of doing business. So now we just have to subtract. So the profit here is going to be equal to, we're just going to subtract, we have 225 and we're subtracting 121.50. Okay, so 121.50 like this. And now we'll just work this out. Zero minus zero is zero. We can't do zero minus five. So we're going to go over here and borrow. We'll turn this into a four. We put a one here, 10 minus five is five. I'll bring down the decimal. 4 minus 1 is 3, 2 minus 2 is 0, and 2 minus 1 is 1. So Liam's profit is $103.50.